Okay, cool. All right, so again, just to start again, um, Tim had talked about uh, in our package I recently developed that's called SD occupancy. Um, or if you put it all together in one word, you can say it as SPA occupancy, which was the motivation behind the, uh, the SPA hand there. Unfortunately, SPOCC was already taken on CRAN as a name. Otherwise, it would have been cool if the name of the package was just SPA. Um, but anyways, so today I'm going to focus specifically on how you can use acoustic data in an occupancy modeling framework. Talk about how you can do that with the Bayesian approach as well. Okay, so just a quick overview of what uh, my plan is for today. I'm going to give a really quick-ish introduction about occupancy modeling and the context of passive acoustics, because I know uh, you all have talked about that a few times in, in this series. Um, then I'm going to briefly talk about spatial autocorrelation, what it is, and why we may need to account for it uh, when we model species distributions. And then uh, lastly, we're going to spend most of the time probably um, Working through some examples on, on SP occupancy, how you can use it to, to fit uh, data for some acoustic detection, non detection data. Um, and we'll talk about that primarily in a single species context. Um, I don't think we'll have time for multi species modeling, but I do have some example code that uh, provided along with this. Okay, and this is all up on GitHub um, the, the slides as well as uh, the um, our scripts that I'm going to be working through a bit later. So feel free to, to download that um, or check it out later um, if you want. Okay, so just uh, to kind of take a step back really quickly about why we would want to do occupancy modeling. Um, so kind of a lot of areas in ecology and applied conservation and management, you can think about trying to understand occupancy or occurrence patterns or dynamics across both space uh, and time for some species that you're interested in, or you could do it for multiple species as well. Okay, so this is definitely a very broad statement, which we can kind of uh, make more specific towards our specific um, goal for our research project. Okay, and so a couple of complexities uh, that we get when we try to model a species distribution are things like imperfect detection. Uh, and spatial autocorrelation, which were kind of the motivation behind uh, developing this package. Okay. And so, first, I'm going to talk about imperfect detection and, and how we address that. Okay. So, specifically in the context of passive acoustics, I uh, have shown here just uh, an ARU. We can imagine that the circle around it is um, kind of the detection radius of the ARU. Okay. And if we're going out, we're trying to sample some birds, potentially multiple bird species. You can imagine that some of these birds are located within the detection radius of the ARU, some are located without or outside of the detection radius of the ARU. So this, this robin that's at the bottom of the screen. Okay, and then in order to detect, to, to detect these birds, we need um, the birds to produce some sort of vocalization. Okay, and this vocalization would need to be picked up by the ARU uh, in order for us to potentially identify that that species is in that area. Okay, so we have some species here, uh, for example, like this chickadee that is within the detection radius, but it doesn't produce a vocalization. And so we're going to miss that species. Um, when we go to analyze our data. And then, of course, this with this robin on the outside produces a vocalization but it's without uh, outside of the range of the ARU, so we don't detect it, okay? And if we fail to account for this imperfect detection process, uh, we can get a lot of biases in our resulting estimates when we go to look at species distributions, um, and then also what uh, environmental factors relate to species occurring across space and time. Okay, and so that leads us to occupancy modeling, which is kind of the the, uh, the standard way which we would try to accommodate this imperfect detection process. Okay, and so the basic idea behind occupancy modeling is that you obtain repeated surveys at a given site to account for this imperfect detection process. Okay, and so what that looks like is ultimately you're left with this uh, detection non detection matrix that I have shown on the left here. Okay, so the rows of this matrix correspond to sites. So these are different sites that we sample. And then what we do is at each site, we obtain multiple surveys um, at that given site. Okay, so in the context of passive acoustics, this would be, you know, something just like a, a recording. Okay, so you can schedule your recorder at different times and you can obtain um, multiple surveys at that site. Okay. And so what we're left with is 
this matrix of zeros and ones. Um, potentially, you also have missing values as well because uh, your ARU failed or, or something like that. Okay, and these zeros and ones indicate whether or not you detected the species at that site during that survey. Okay, and the benefit of ARUs is that um, once you get an ARU out to an area, it's relatively easy to obtain replicate surveys compared to you know going out multiple times to do a point count survey. Okay, and so we're able to get uh, potentially a large number of repeat surveys uh, at each site, which can really help with with estimating occupancy probability and accounting for that imperfect detection. Okay, and I do want to note that I'm here assuming that there's no false positives in this detection non-detection matrix. Okay, so what I uh, what I mean by that is that we don't uh, observe a species if it's not truly there. Okay, and so if you derive these data from an automated algorithm, you may need to do some sort of validation to ensure uh, that you can make this assumption. Um, but generally for, for the models in SP occupancy I'm going to talk about today, we, we assume no false positives. All right, and I'm just going to briefly just mention these kind of what the model looks like under the hood, um, just so we're all on the same page. And really what an occupancy model is, is it's two distinct models, kind of two separate models put on top of each other. So really two logistic regressions. The first model, what we do is we model occupancy probability. Okay, so occupancy probability is this, this psi. We model that at each site, j. And we model that occupancy probability as a function of a variety of, of environmental covariates or predictors that we think are gonna influence occupancy probability. And then our second component is where we account for that imperfect detection process. Okay, so our data are these y values. These y values are uh, the detection or non-detection at each site during each uh, replicate k. And what we do is we model this conditional on there being the species at the area, okay? So again, in order to detect the species, you need it to be actually present at the area, okay? And then once we, uh, we do that, we can model this detection probability as a function of a variety of covariates as well. All right, so that's kind of the basic structure of our occupancy model here allows us to account for these two different processes. Okay, now the second component, second complexity, uh, you know, that we may be curious about when we fit occupancy models or species distribution models is this concept of spatial autocorrelation. Okay, and on the right, I just have a couple maps that kind of exhibit how things are similar to each other across space. From the top, it's just a occupancy probability of some of a uh, black throated green warbler uh, estimated from a model in the northeastern US. And then the bottom right is uh, species richness of a community of 12 birds in Hubbard Brook experimental forest. Okay, and my point with just showing these is just uh, basically this, this kind of concept of spatial autocorrelation being that, that things closer together in space tend to be more similar than things farther apart. Okay, so that's kind of the basic um, kind of statement of what spatial autocorrelation is. All right, and when we think about spatial autocorrelation in the context, context of species distributions, it's important that we think about what kind of drives the spatial autocorrelation, okay? So kind of two common things we can think about are um, kind of environmental drivers or the habitat requirements of different species, okay? So species has specific habitat requirements, things like um, forest cover or, or temperature. And these underlying environmental drivers themselves are, are very uh, continuous in space. So they're correlated in space. Okay. So if the resources that the species requires are spatially correlated, we'll likely see correlation in the species distribution as well. And then we can also see spatial correlation uh, as a result of biotic factors. So things like uh, dispersal or common specific attraction that can lead to uh, kind of species occupying areas closer together in space than we would expect. Okay, and when we go to model this in an occupancy modeling framework, what we're really concerned about is this concept that's called residual spatial autocorrelation. Okay, and what I mean by that is spatial correlation that exists in your estimates after you include spatial covariates. Okay, so when you go to fit a model, uh, if you're fitting occupancy for some species you're interested in, you know that uh, occupancy probability varies across space, right? So you have a set of covariates that you think are going to explain that variability. 
But often we don't have all the covariates that explain uh, the spatial variability. They may not be available to us, or we're just missing some um, that we, we could include. Um, and so in that case, we may see this concept of residual spatial autocorrelation. And we should account for that in our model using what are called spatial random effects. Okay, And so if we fail to do this, what happens is we can get overly precise estimates, um, or we could actually see some bias in our estimates as well. Okay, so something we want to account for. And just to emphasize in the equations, if this is something you're interested in, um, this is a really simple extension to account for spatial autocorrelation. There's just a slight difference in the occupancy model where we add in this W sub J, okay, and these Ws are what are called spatial random effects and we model them um, using some, some spatial statistics techniques. And so these two uh, complexities led us to the development of the SP occupancy R package, okay? And so what it's designed to do is it's designed to fit um, Bayesian single species and multi-species occupancy models, okay? And so I'll get into the Bayesian aspect of that in a second here. Um, and, and kind of really the main purpose of it was to do this in a relatively efficient manner. Okay, so Bayesian models in general can be pretty slow, um, especially if you try to account for spatial autocorrelation as well as imperfect detection. Okay, so, so our, our purpose of this was to kind of uh, uh, fit these models uh, in a relatively efficient manner. Okay, and then one of the nice things about SP occupancy is the workflow is completely in R. Okay, so you can fit a Bayesian model directly in R without having to use uh, some Bayesian programming languages, which are really great uh, and flexible, but sometimes it requires kind of an additional uh, learning process that can be uh, somewhat challenging. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about this today, uh, but just wanted to mention there's a variety of functionality. In SP occupancy, so things like uh, corporate data integration. Um, you can use uh, embed species correlations. Uh, and I also just uh, put on CRAN a few days ago uh, functionality for fitting multi season or spatiotemporal models so you can assess trends uh, in occupancy over space and time. Okay, let's take so let's take a step back, think a little bit about the Bayesian part of this. Okay, so I'm not going to obviously in a few minutes go through all of Bayesian computation, Bayesian statistics, but I do want to get you uh, kind of everyone on the same page so um, we can go ahead and fit these these models. Okay, I don't know what went on here, but it looks like I cut off some words. Um, but basically, the, the main approach we use uh, for computation in SP occupancy and in, in Bayesian statistics generally is what's called MCMC or Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. Okay. And what this does is it kind of results in the sequence of dependent random numbers. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is, is kind of you just have a bunch of numbers um, and these are somewhat dependent on each other. Okay, and what happens is these these uh, when you when you do the sampling, this MCMC sampling, eventually your model is going to converge to something that's called the posterior distribution. And this posterior distribution is really what uh, Bayesians are interested in. Okay, so um, it's what we use to get things like parameter estimates. So you get your means, the things you use to kind of summarize your results as well as your metrics of uncertainty, okay? So things uh, in Bayesian framework, these are called credible intervals, okay? And so these two figures kind of showcase uh, MCMC sampling and, and, and kind of what uh, some results would look like from it, all right? So shown here on the left is what's called a, a trace plot of a, an MCMC chain, okay? So this is referred to as a chain. What you can see on the x-axis are the, the iterations of the samples. Okay, so in this case, I ran my model and, and my resulting output gave me 3,000 samples uh, for this parameter estimate, which in turn, which in this case is, is uh, an intercept. Okay, and what each of these values are is it's the estimated value for the intercept uh, at each of the sample. Okay, so you get 3,000 total uh, values for this. And then this, these, these, Estimates are what you can ultimately summarize uh, to get your um, your means and your credible intervals. Okay, and I have that kind of shown in an alternative view on the right, uh, which is what's called the posterior density. 
basically on the x-axis is our, is our parameter value, you can imagine. And these, this is kind of our results from the MCMC algorithm. We get this posterior distribution of values for any parameter that we estimate. Okay, so in this case, um, we could summarize it using um, perhaps the mean or the median of the distribution, which would be right at zero in this case. And then these lines would be what we would use to quantify uncertainty in our estimates. So this is what's called a 95% credible interval. Okay, and so when you fit these models, uh, in particular in SPI occupancy, what do you need to specify, right? So this is the basics uh, behind how you would go about fitting a Bayesian model. Okay, so the first thing you need to specify is what's called a prior or a prior distribution. Okay, this is often a key of Bayesian analysis where you specify prior information on the values that you're trying to estimate. Okay, and this, um, this prior information can be uh, what's called weakly informant. Okay, you can basically assign basically tell uh, your computer that you don't know anything about the parameters. Um, and this will result in really similar estimates to uh, kind of a standard approach for putting these models. Second, uh, you need to supply initial values. So kind of your best guess of the parameters to start off. Usually these aren't very important. Um, so we won't really spend too much time thinking about these. And then you also have to specify aspects of the sample. So how many samples or iterations do you want to run? Um, and then some initial, uh, some additional characteristics of the MCMC algorithm as well. Okay, so these two things are called a burn-in rate uh, and a thinning rate. Okay, and so basically what this burn-in means is that we're going to run the model for a set number of samples. But that beginning part of the period, we don't want to keep those samples because they may not be reliable. So what we do is we just throw out some of those samples, okay? And that, uh, however many samples you decide to throw out, that's referred to as your burn-in period. And then uh, the last thing is what's called a thinning rate. So basically, this just answers the question, how often do you want to save a sample? Okay, so ideally, we, we probably wouldn't need to do any uh, thinning, as it's so called. Um, but we do this because if you have to save a lot of samples, it can take up a lot of space on your computer. Okay, so sometimes it can be uh, relatively easy to just uh, only save, for example, every fifth sample, um, and then you run your model um, and just save those samples. Okay, so those are kind of the basic things you need to specify to get a basic model running. And then I briefly mentioned that uh, when you do this sort of sampling, you have to make sure that your model converges. And so once it reaches convergence, you can rely on these estimates um, to kind of summarize your results. But before that, uh, you shouldn't interpret their, their estimates because they could be misleading, okay? So how do you determine convergence? Well, the, the idea is to run multiple MCMC chains at the same time or kind of sequentially. And what you do is you start them at different values. And if the chains eventually look the same, they look very similar, they give you very similar results, then you can assume convergence, okay? So that's kind of the standard way we'll do that um, in SP occupancy when we go into the models. Okay, so what are the benefits of Bayesian analysis? Well, because I'm a Bayesian, I could talk about this all day, but I'm just gonna summarize it in a few points here. First would be interpretation. You can make direct probability statements regarding your estimates. So for example, if you were interested in occupancy probability of some bird species, you could make a statement that said something like there's a 95% probability that there's a positive effect of forest cover on um, occupancy probability of my bird. Okay, so that's a relatively uh, intuitive interpretation um, and a key benefit of Bayesian analysis. Second, kind of specific to these models that I'm talking about, is it's more flexible to accommodate spatial autocorrelation as opposed to uh, more uh, standard approaches. And really, the key benefit, one of the key benefits to me, is that the extensions of these models um, can be readily made in a multi species or in a Bayesian framework for more complex models. So things like putting multi species models or combining multiple data sources. Fourth, you can get reliable estimates of uncertainty. 
And then fifth, kind of in particular for acoustic data, we know that data from ARUs, regardless of how we summarize them, if we're, if we're trying to do an occupancy analysis or if we're trying to do um, some kind of more ecoacoustic analysis or thing of that nature, these can be really complex data because they can be highly correlated across time. Often we get multiple recordings across time. We may need to account for that. Um, and we can have multiple variables that we're interested in. You know, so maybe you're interested in summarizing a bunch of acoustic indices. Uh, Bayesian approach can readily handle uh, those types of, of multiple response variables at the same time. And then lastly, the Bayesian approach can uh, readily accommodate false positives from automated algorithms. Okay, I think this is a, a, a pretty important uh, aspect for acoustic data in, in particular because uh, as automated algorithms get further developed, things like, like BirdNet and, and other things, um, if we want to accommodate any false positives, any false positives that we uh, believe are in the algorithms, we can readily do that in a basic analysis. And there's been a few different papers, uh, including one of my own, and I think all these are in MEE, Methods in Ecology and Evolution, um, that have kind of looked at uh, using data from ARUs and, and accommodating false positives in some, some um, pretty nifty ways. So I'll encourage you to check those out if, if that's something you're interested in. Okay, so that's kind of the background of, of kind of occupancy modeling, spatial autocorrelation, and Bayesian analysis I wanted to give. And so now we'll get into kind of the example that we're going to work with, and then I'll we'll kind of walk through fitting one of these occupancy models in, in SP occupancy. Okay, so here uh, what I'm using for the example data set are uh, some data that uh, Jose uh, Ribeiro Jr. provided me um, from uh, his paper in 2018, Ecological Applications. And what they were interested in looking at was kind of the effects of different land use on uh, kind of agriculture, or the effects of different land use, excuse me, on tropical amphibian communities in the area. Okay, and so what they did is they sampled 50 sites along a gradient of landscape characteristics, which you can see in this map from their paper on the right. And they had a variety of data types at each of these locations, but here what we're going to use in our example is, is three ARU recordings that they obtained at each site, okay, and from each of these recordings they derived whether or not uh, a species was present in that recording, okay, I believe they did it manually by listening to these recordings. Okay, and in total they analyzed 36 amphibian species. Um, I probably won't get to the multi-species uh, example we have, but if we have time, I will show how we can fit a model for all of those species simultaneously. Um, but for now, I'm going to focus on a single species um, uh, of frogs, so this Crossodactylus um is what we're going to do our example with. Okay, and just to mention how the SP occupancy workflow will work, and this is how these, these scripts in the GitHub repository are set up. Basically, there's kind of six steps to fit in this uh, analysis, so, which are pretty similar to all sorts of statistical analysis. Um, so the first would be this, this kind of data prep section. You can also simulate data if you want to kind of explore different situations, do some sort of power analysis. Then we would actually fit the models. We would validate the models, and potentially compare different models if that's something we were interested in. Um, and then we would summarize our results and ultimately uh, we could make new predictions if that's something we're interested in or do um, inference on the effects of different covariates or predictor variables, okay? All right, so now I'm going to switch over to RStudio and I'm going to walk through um, one of the examples that's provided on this, this GitHub repository here. Okay. And feel free to uh, chime in if you have any questions or anything. You can't seem to find the chat. I always tend to lose it on Zoom. Um, but if you have any questions, then, then let me know. Okay, so I have my RStudio screen up. I'll kind of orient you to my screen um, just so you're, you're familiar with the layout of how I have it. Uh, on the left is my, uh, my script window, and then I have my console window shown on the right here, which I'm actually going to extend. And uh, feel free to tell me to uh, increase the size of my window if it's too small to see. All right, but basically what we're gonna do here is we're gonna try to fit a single species occupancy model to understand how uh, different, uh, land use and 
can land use some topographical features across this area influence occupancy probability of a single uh, species of frog, okay? All right, so I'm just gonna kind of run these lines, just to get started. First thing we'll do is just load the package. It's on CRAN, so you just load it using library. Okay, and then a few packages for plotting. We actually don't use this package, um, but we do use ggplot too. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we'll talk about how, kind of how we format data for use in SP occupancy, if you want to fit a Bayesian occupancy model, okay? And so in the data section of the GitHub repository, you'll find this R data file, okay, which contains the data that we need for fitting uh, an occupancy model in SP occupancy. Okay, so go ahead and load that. If I take a look at my environment window, I should see that the uh, data.list object shows up there. All right, so let's go ahead and check out what's in that data.list object. Okay, so this is already formatted in the standard format that SP occupancy requires models to be in. All right, and so what this is, is it's a list object that has four components to it. All right, the first component is uh, labeled Y, which is the detection non detection data. So the actual data that you collect on uh, your species of interest. Second component is this OCC.coats, which are your occupancy or your occurrence covariates. Third component is your detection covariates, det.coves. And then the fourth component is labeled cohorts or uh, spatial coordinates, uh, or the, just the coordinates of your sites that you're- Could you uh, explain, could you explain what the detection covariates is? Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna go through each of these one by one, like ah, the components okay. of, of each of these. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So this first component is why is, uh, again, the detection on detection data. And what we have uh, for this here currently is formatted for a multi-species model. So what we have is that's a three-dimensional array where what we have are the first dimension corresponds to the species we have in the model. Okay, in this case, we have 36 species. Second dimension corresponds to all of our sites. So we have 50 sites that we're working with. And then the final dimension corresponds to the um, the three kind of repeat visits or three recordings that we have at each of these sites, okay? So this is how we would format it for a multi-species model. For a single species, which I'll show in a second, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna have these final two things, right? So we only have one species, so all we're gonna be left with is just that detection, non-detection data matrix that I, that I um, talked about before where we have, um, where we have rows corresponding to sites and columns corresponding to uh, visits. All right, the occupancy covariates, what we have here is a data frame. And the data frame has the sites as the rows. So we have 50 sites that we're modeling for. And then the columns correspond to different variables that you want in the model. Okay, so in this case, we have five variables, which all come um, from Jose's analysis. We have amount of forest cover, amount of agriculture, catchment in the area, density of, uh, of the um, water, and then um, the, the slope of the surrounding area. Again, we're modeling the occupancy probability of a, a frog that relies on uh, uh, aquatic areas. Okay, and then the third component is the detection covariates, so that's done dot codes. All right, and you can see that it's format is a bit different from the occupancy covariates, and that is formatted as a list, okay? And so why is it formatted as a list? Well, that's because the detection covariates can vary across both your site and across your repeat surveys. So across your um, different recordings, all right? So you'll often have variables that vary at what's called the survey or the uh, observation level. Okay, and what we have here is that each component of the list is just a separate covariate that we have in our, in our model, all right? So in this case, we have two, we have date and we have um, rain, okay? So date, is the day of the year that the that the recording is obtained. And so you can see that this is a, a matrix where we have a different value for each site and each recording at each site, okay? And then rain is similar. We have, uh, this is just the amount of rain that occurred on that day, if there was any, um, or, or, uh, or across a period of time. And so this again 
uh, has a unique value for each site and for each uh, recording or repeat visit that we have. Okay, and then lastly, these, these cohorts, that's the spatial coordinates. And this is a matrix with rows corresponding to sites, so 50 sites. And then the two columns are just the X and Y values um, of your spatial coordinates for each site. Okay, and this actually isn't required unless you fit a model with spatial random effects. Okay, so if you don't have these, uh, that's not a problem if you're just fitting a standard occupancy model. Okay, so again, this is the basic format of what we would require for fitting a model in SP occupancy. Again, what we're going to do next is uh, kind of filter out the data just so we're working with single species at one time. All right, so I'm just going to run this, this set of five lines, which, is, which does that. And basically what I do is I create this new object, which is just the data for my single species, it's Crossodactylus caramaski. And I'm just going to refer to that as, as Crocar, and I label it as data.crocar. Okay, and if we take a look at that on the right, the only thing that changes is the detection on detection data. So now note that this is just a, uh, a matrix with columns corresponding to sites, or with rows corresponding to sites, excuse me, and then columns corresponding to your recordings that you have at each site. Okay, so that's kind of that familiar detection on detection data matrix that we have. Okay, so that is the data formatting section. Next section, we can actually get into the fun stuff where we get to fit the models. Okay, so first, I'm going to fit two models a uh, basic uh, single species occupancy model, and then a single species occupancy model that also has spatial random effects in the model. Okay. The function names for the model fitting functions all uh, kind of extend this uh, first name. So it's called PGOCC or PGOC. And what that stands for, maybe wondering what PG is, it's, it's polygamma occupancy model. Okay, so polygamma is just a statistical trick that we use to kind of make these models a bit faster. Um, and I just put that in the, the function names to make that clear. Okay, and so what do we specify to PGOC to get uh, an occupancy model to fit? First two things are the formulas for the occupancy portion of the model and the detection portion of the model. Okay, and so for uh, the Occupancy, our, our formula is, our argument is called OCC.formula. And here you can see I've included all five of the covariates that we had in our OCC.coves object on the right. Okay, and what I did here is I used the scale function. And what that does is it standardizes my covariate values. And the reason I did this um, is because uh, standardizing your covariates to have a mean of zero and standard deviation of one can help uh, when you fit a Bayesian model, uh, it can often help lead to faster convergence. So you won't have to wait as long for your models to run. Okay, and notice that this uses kind of standard R model syntax. So if you wanted to include quadratic effects, you can do that. Note that you need to include the, the kind of tilde uh, and you don't include the left side of the tilde. Okay, you only include the right side. You do the same sort of thing for the detection portion of the model. So this detection formula or dot dot formula. Here we include a linear effect of date. Again, I scale all these variables. I also include a quadratic effect of date because I think that that might be a, a nonlinear effect. And then I also include a linear effect of the amount of rain as that could uh, kind of inhibit uh, my error from, from detecting these, these species or those species. Okay, the next argument, the next required argument is data. Okay, so that's just where you supply the list object that, that uh, we created, so that data.crocar. All right, so I just supply that in there and, uh, and SP occupancy will know where to find the data. And then the next uh, four arguments correspond to those things I was talking about with the MCMC. Okay, so we have to tell our how long and kind of what criteria we, we want to use to, uh, uh, to fit this, this Bayesian model. And so what I specify here is I tell R I'm going to run this model for 5,000 samples. I'm going to throw away the first 3,000 samples is what this n.burn argument corresponds to. I'm only going to keep every second sample that I run. Okay, so that's just so my, my uh, computer doesn't run out of memory. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to run three 
chains of my MCMC. Remember I said to assess whether our model converges, we can run multiple chains. So in this case, I'm gonna run three models or three chains to do that. Okay, and then finally, this, this n.report argument uh, is used to tell our uh, how many or how often to report progress on the model fitting back to the screen of the user. Okay, so this can be really useful for when you're fitting models that take a really long time. Okay, there's a bunch of other arguments as well, and you can check that out in the help page for PGOC, uh, which has a lot of detail um, and uh, more explanation on these arguments. But if I go ahead and run that, we should see it go pretty quickly. Okay, so if I scroll up to the top here, where I ran my model, we're gonna see a few different things and they're usually split up by these different sections. Okay, so this first section, we have the uh, preparing to run the model. And we see here that SPOxy tells us uh, kind of information about two things that I ignored when I fit in the model. So the prior distributions, as well as the initial values. Okay, and so what we've done with SP occupancy is that by default, uh, you're going to have very weakly informative priors placed on all your parameters in the model, um, and the initial values will be chosen to be suitable um, values that will lead to model convergence and won't cause any problems. Okay, and so this uh, is just to let the user know explicitly what the, the underlying assumptions of the formula is, or of the function is. Okay, and then if we scroll down, you see some information about the model that you're fitting. And then this part is where we actually see the model progress um, and how it goes. And because this model fit really quickly, this didn't really give us any useful information, but uh, as we'll see with this spatial model, it takes a little bit longer. And so we'll see this kind of update in real time as the model goes through and, 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 and fits. Okay, and so I named this out, which is what I usually name the results of my models. And Kind of the first thing I would, would usually do with a uh, model from fitting in SP occupancy would be to use this summary function, which is going to present some, some pretty concise results uh, about what comes from the model. Okay. And so what we see here is some information on the MCMC sampler, uh, as well as how long the model took to run, which in this case was pretty quick. And then down here is really where the interesting stuff is. So that's where we have our summaries of our different parameter effects for both the occupancy or the occurrence portion of the model, as well as the detection portion of the model, okay? Now, I'll just mention this really quickly. Um, I also include in the summary two measures that you can use to assess whether your model converges, okay? This first is called R hat. And if our model converges, we'll generally see these values be less than 1.1, okay? So in this case, if I scroll down, Looks like all of these are less than 1.1, so we're in pretty good shape. And then this ESS stands for effective sample size. Again, this is a way we can assess how well our model, uh, how well the algorithm kind of ran. Generally, we just want to see pretty large numbers uh, for this, uh, this value, so generally above 100 or a couple hundred or so. And we see that's pretty good here. Okay. So that's kind of the basics you need to fit a non space or a kind of basic single species occupancy model. Um, to fit a spatial single species occupancy model, function name just adds on this SP at the front of the, the PG OC model from before. Okay, so we have the SP PG OC. All right, and the, the syntax for the model looks really similar to what we saw before. Basically, we have our occurrence or our occupancy formula, our detection formula, our data. And then there are some slight differences in how we specify the MCMC parameters. And I'll let you kind of explore that uh, if you're interested on your own in the help pages. Um, but really, uh, it just boils down to specifying the total number of samples we're going to run. And then again, we report our sample progress. Okay, so now let's fit a model where we um, also account for spatial autocorrelation. Okay, so I'll go ahead and run this. And we should now see on the right. This model takes a bit longer because spatial models generally take longer than models that don't have spatial random effects. And we also see some information that's being presented out on some of the model parameters. Again, you can check out the help pages for this, but basically 
what I when I see this, what I want to do is I want to look at these acceptance rates and I want to make sure that they kind of hover around 40 ish or 50 ish or so. Basically, I just want to see if they're all really low towards zero or if they're really high towards 100. If they're not, then I feel pretty good. If they are, then I'd encourage you to run them all for a bit longer. OK. And I'm going to go really quick through the rest of this. Um, Again, we can use the summary object to summarize the results from the spatial occupancy model. Again, we see this, this, this kind of summary uh, of our parameter estimates, which again, we can kind of interpret um, kind of uh, how we're used to. So for example, if I look at the effect of forest cover on occupancy, I see the mean value is pretty negative. So it's negative 1.33. And then if I look at this 2.5%, 97.5%, these are uh, the two things we'd use to create a 95% credible interval, okay? And um, what we see here is that our 95% credible interval is all negative, which tells us that it doesn't intercept zero, which ultimately tells us that there's a, a, a negative effect on a forest cover on occupancy probability for this, this frog species. Frog species. <clears throat> okay. And then quickly, I'll go through this model validation. When we fit a model, we want to make sure that it fits the data well. And the function SV occupancy, we allow for you to do that. It's called PPC OCC, which stands for Posterior Predictive Check of an Occupancy Model. Okay, I won't go into the details about this, but um, we can go ahead and do this. And basically, how we would assess whether or not our model fit well is by computing what's called a Bayesian p value. The Bayesian p value, we want it to fall kind of around 0.5, which tells us that our model uh, is, a, is a pretty good fit to the data. And uh, generally, we kind of have these somewhat arbitrary cutoffs of 0.1 and 0.9, where if our value is kind of between those, uh, we can say that our, our model is a decent fit to the data. Okay, and here I ran these two things for the two models we just fit. And we see that these are both uh, above 0.1, although they're slightly small. Uh, but for now, we can feel pretty good about continuing with our models. All right, and quickly for model comparison, uh, we use what's called the Widely Applicable Information Criterion, or the WAIC. And this is, works just like the AIC, uh, if you're familiar with that, uh, with maximum likelihood, where uh, lower values indicate better model fit. So if I go ahead and compare the values that I get from the basic occupancy model to the spatial occupancy model. You see that it's slightly lower for the spatial occupancy model, but it's not uh, all that much lower. So we might just keep going with uh, the, the non-spatial model for now. Okay, and now that we've kind of done the model validation, model uh, comparison, if we're interested in, we can kind of summarize the results from a model. Again, you can check out the summary out uh, uh, results, which gives a concise summary of the results. You can also look deeper into the model object, which has a bunch of things inside of it. Um, but really, these things that end in samples are the estimates um, of your parameters that you might be interested in. Okay, so you can access these to summarize uh, different results. Okay, and kind of one example of how to do that, these beta dot samples correspond to the effects of the occupancy uh, covariate effects, All right? So if I wanted to look at the effect of, um, this is actually a typo, this should be the effect of density on occupancy probability. If I run this line, this 0.96, what this corresponds to is there's a 96% probability that the effect of density on occupancy is positive. Okay, so that's just one way that you can summarize these, these models as an example. All right, and, and lastly, I'll end with a few figures uh, of how we can do this. And for this, I use the MCMC this packet, which is really nifty, and you can just supply the results from the models directly inside there. Um, and so if I wanted to look at my occupancy effects, what I can do is plot this here, and this gives us the effects of our uh, five different covariates on occupancy. Again, here, we can see that the effect of forest cover is negative, so it doesn't intercept the zero. 
And we see a pretty positive effect of density on occupancy probability as well. Okay. And you can do the same thing for uh, your detection model as well. So here we see a kind of a moderate negative effect of date, uh, linear effect of date, as well as a, a more positive effect of, of rain on detection probability, which is pretty interesting. Okay, and then lastly, I'm not going to walk through the code just for sake of time, uh, but you can do prediction in SD occupancy using the, the predict function. So here what I did is I just created uh, a set of values to predict occupancy probability along the gradient of, of kind of potential forest values. So really, my goal with this code was just to create um, this plot here, which shows um, that occupancy probability decreases with forest cover. Okay, so that's about it for the single species example. I think I'll leave it there. And again, you can check out this multi-species example as well, which is in the GitHub repository if you're interested in. And um, I'll just zoom back real quickly to my slides. Just to mention that there's a bunch of resources online. You should be able to link to all these uh, in the PDF that's on the GitHub if you want to access them. So check those out if you're interested in. And then um, I'll quickly just thank all uh, the people who have been associated with the work that, that this project has been, uh, that have been involved in the work for this project. And uh, a big thanks to Jose for, for letting me use this data for this example. All right. And thank you all for listening. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to talk about it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. That's really cool to see the inner workings like that, especially the code part. So we will open the floor to questions. There are some for you in the chat, Jeff, but if others, if you have questions, just put up a hand or drop questions in the chat to hop in. Okay, great. Yes, I see the one in the chat. How many uh, covariates can we have if we have 50 sites? So it kind of depends on, on how many um, detections you have of your species. Um, but uh, we definitely wouldn't be able to have more than, than 50. Uh, you know, I can't really give a, a fine line as to what it would be, um, you know, but, but probably uh, you could play around with it. I'm sure you could probably get maybe, maybe 10 or so, but it depends on kind of a lot of different factors associated with uh, that species that you're interested in. When you're working with ARU data and selecting sampling intervals, how do you decide where to break those? Is it just sort of a, you know, if you have recordings that are out there continuously for a month, is that one sample? Is it one sample per day? How do you, what goes into those? Yeah, things? yeah, that's a great, a great question. Um, you know, I think again, that depends a lot on um, kind of the vocalization rate of the species that you're interested in. Um, also, probably the question that you're interested in as well, um, kind of along the time scale, as well as this concept of, of kind of what's called closure. Um, so closure means kind of in these occupancy models, you assume that a species kind of stays at a site if it's there within um, the period of time over which your recordings last. Okay, so if, if if your, your species moves around a lot, you might want to have your, your uh, recordings be pretty close in time or your repeat visits be close in time um, to kind of ensure uh, that, that that assumption is met. Um, but really, I don't, I don't have a, a fine answer to that. I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. Okay, looks like there's another question in the chat. Uh, this is a bit of how Bayesian MCMC tackles spatial autocorrelation. Can you help clarify that a bit again? Yeah, so what I did is um, in these models, we include spatial random effects using what's called uh, a nearest neighbor Gaussian process. Um, and so the details of that you can see um, in some of those resources I listed at the end of the slide. But basically what it does is it adds in this random effect to the model, um, which, um, ultimately uh, allows for sites closer together in space to kind of share information um, and account for that additional spatial autocorrelation if that exists, okay. And Aaron, looks like you got your hand up. Hey, Jeff, how's it going? Good presentation, really. Good. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, totally. 
Hey, uh, so one of the questions I had, and, and you know my line of work uh, that we do monitoring and we're always trying to adapt and optimize that. Uh, one of the questions that, and I probably brought this up to you in the past is, so when you fit your spatial occupancy model, uh, can you actually estimate through the spatial correlation, the distance, the actual geographical distance at which let's say occupancy of oven bird or whatnot is correlated? And, and then we can utilize that information to potentially adapt our monitoring or other sampling? Yeah, Aaron, that's a really great question. Um, so there is a parameter that you estimate um, in the output, it's labeled as fee, but it's called spatial uh, decay parameter. And so um, that gives information on, on how far exactly that, that spatial autocorrelation goes out. Okay, so that can, help inform, you know, where you select your sites. Um, I will caution interpretation of it drastically um, because it can be tricky to estimate in particular when you have data like occupancy data, which are a zero or a one. Um, so it's tricky to estimate it. Um, but yeah, it can inform how similar and how far that spatial autocorrelation goes to help inform that, that sampling process. It's a great question. But so you basically need to take that fee estimate and uh, basically uh, fit a fun like a, a function to that to in order to estimate what, yeah, I think, you know, so, like a variogram analysis at that. Right. And that levels off and that's the distance at which those observations are correlated. This, this is, you can estimate that similarly. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So you can, there's kind of two parameters associated with spatial autocorrelation, the, the sigma squared versus the variance, which is related to uh, kind of in the covariogram language, like the partial sill. Um, and then uh, the spatial decay parameter. Yeah, basically you would take, the estimate of spatial decay parameter is a bit tricky, um, but basically if you do three divided by that estimate, that gives you the distance at which uh, kind of 95% of the spatial autocorrelation is explained. All right, so most of that autocorrelation would be explained within three divided by your estimate of the spatial range parameter. Um, and yeah, you can, it's again, it's tricky to derive those covariogram, uh, covariograms with uh, binary data um, like this, uh, but they can be, they can be estimated. So that's a good point. Okay, no, thanks a lot. It seems like it would be, there may be some interesting ecological questions to be able to address if we could understand that, uh, you know, that uh, geographic variability as well as adapting our monitoring. Thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so looks like another question in the chat. How many spatial replicates should we need for a good occupancy estimation? For example, I have recordings for eight independent sites for a year 24-7 got all bird detections ready from this data set and I'm stuck with analysis whether to do an occupancy analysis or to do some other model. So again, I'm gonna give a kind of not a, a, a desired answer of, of kind of it depends on a lot of things, but, but eight independent sites, that's a pretty low number of sites to fit one of these occupancy models. Um, generally uh, with that few number of sites, it can be pretty tricky to parse apart your, your occupancy from your detection. So you may see that your estimates are just widely uncertain. So you wouldn't re really be able to get a lot of good information out of them. So in a case where you only have a few sites, uh, you know, you may kind of be stuck with uh, doing a, a, a kind of a logistic regression without trying to split apart between the occupancy and detection. Um, but uh, uh, that's not totally impossible, but, but it is kind of tricky with a, a few sites like that. Generally, you know, 20 sites or so is, 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 is a pretty good result. And there's some good resources out there uh, uh, by Mark Carey and, and Andy Royal that have some nice summary figures of how reliable your estimates can be with, with different amounts of sites and replications. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Uh, I have a couple of questions and a couple of questions there. So that was a nice Hi. presentation. One of the question is, can we use that WAIC uh, metric to compare different models if we have different covariates? Yeah, absolutely. So that it works just like kind of uh, AIC or, or model selection when you fit these models kind of with the maximum likelihood approach. And yeah, absolutely. You can compare different covariates in the model for sure. Mm 
second question how do you deal with categorical variables because most of the variables that you used in your models were continuous if i have something categorical can i still fit it using spock sp occupancy <laughs> <laughs> yeah you definitely can um so basically the default will be to fit it using um it's called the effects parameterization so basically in your cat you would just put the categorical variable into the model uh, so you'd have it in your 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 data frame uh, or in the, the data just like you would the occupancy covariates and had have, have your different levels to the categories basically when you when you put that in there um what sp occupancy will do by default is is assign one of the levels to the intercept and then the rest of those estimates will be kind of the deviations from that value okay and i think that's kind of a default with with lm and, and glm as well um, when you put those in there but yeah it can handle that and how do you deal with highly correlated covariates like probably the agriculture and forest covariate in your data set might be highly correlated is Bayesian models very good with correlated data like that so the I guess the short answer is no um, I think sometimes the algorithms can be a bit more stable you know you might be able to fit a model with a uh, with this algorithm when you have highly correlated covariates, but kind of the same problems that you encounter with the basic model are kind of still exist. So, you know, it's if you have two highly correlated covariates, if you want to include them both in the model, you want to change one without changing the other, it just kind of leads to those problems with um, interpretation. So, so short answer, the interpretational problems still exist. You might be able to get the models to fit. Um, but again, those those kind of interpretations still still are there. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Laurel uh, mentioned in the chat. Uh, it's the end of the official time. If, if I'm happy to stay around, uh, but also just totally feel free to leave. It's cool by me. Thanks everyone for for coming. Thank you, Jeff, for coming out and sharing. Recognizing one. Uh... Together. Oh, sorry. One announcement just before everybody tunes off. In two weeks, um, we have another very interesting speaker, Carol Bedoya, who will be talking about using acoustics to fingerprint um, individuals, um, I think, with some endangered parrot species in New Zealand. And I worked with Carol during my PhD, and he's a really, really cool and bright guy uh, from Columbia. And I'm very excited for his presentation. So mark that on your calendars, uh, 10.30 Eastern time um, in two weeks. So that will be August 2nd. Um, yeah. And Jeff, that was really interesting. And I am look forward to using this. Um, I've been interested in Bayesian techniques for a while, but it's always the case that when uh, in our package comes around, it's the, the best excuse to really dive in um, get over some of that statistical inertia that that you might have. So this is thanks for taking us under the hood. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Okay, see you all soon. Enjoy the weekend. No, oh, whatever it's coming up. <laughs> I'm about to travel to a conference. <laughs> all right, take care, everybody.